And I'd like to welcome everyone to our study of the book of Hebrews. We are now in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. And there's 13 chapters in the book. So keep in mind that we'll have two more weeks after this week, and then we will be finished. And this has been a real profound study for me. I hope that y'all have enjoyed it. I think that uh, the payoff comes after the truths really begin to sink in. And uh, you can relate to them as you study other books of the Bible. And we'll see this even as we go into the book of Hebrews. This is a great book to study before we go into the next one. So let's go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and read everyone. All right. And y'all go ahead and keep yourselves muted um, unless you are sharing, but we do want you to feel free to share, especially tonight. I'm really hoping that during these chapters of application where we've done the hard work of studying the doctrine and now we're in application. And I'd love to hear input from everyone, for those of you online, as well as everyone in the room. Um, so let's go ahead and be opening up your Bibles uh, to Hebrews 11, and we will get started. And now, I mean, you guys are like Hebrew scholars. I mean, you know the book of Hebrews better than most People. This isn't a book that is studied very often, and a lot of it is because of its unusual context. When we're dealing with, uh, we don't know who the author is, but he was or she was likely writing to a Jewish audience, and you've kind of picked up that flavor now as we've gone through it. Can you understand now why it's suggested? As we go back now and look at these possible authors, Maybe it makes more sense to you now to consider who could have written this book now that you've studied it for yourselves, because we have gone verse by verse. And uh, if you compare this book to the book of Romans, you might understand why people have considered Paul as a possible author. But then when you look at the differences as far as some of the phrases that he uses and his emphasis, then you can understand why it may not be him. Could have been a student of Paul. It could have been Luke. Could have been Barnabas, Clement of Rome, Apollo, Silvanus, Aquila, Priscilla, Silas. Uh, I added Silas. I think he's a, a good option, but we don't know. Uh, but the date, again, being around AD 62. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody again. Let me see. Because I don't know why we're hearing some background noise here. And so you may just want to kind of watch your mute button and keep it muted. You'd be surprised. We can hear background noise, even if it's like your air conditioner coming on uh, or your papers when you're moving those around. So uh, just all you have to do is unmute yourself when you're ready to talk, and then you can mute it right back, and that works really good. Um, the, the author is most likely writing to Jewish Christians, perhaps second generation, living in Jerusalem, maybe Rome, I'm not sure. But we have just a few more weeks to kind of review this book. And these are things that you'll always want to remember when you're going back to this book and, and uh, looking at its context. Uh, here's the outline of Hebrews that we have followed. There are other outlines uh, that you can look at and compare, but I've enjoyed this one because it's really focused on the majesty of Messiah, how Jesus is better than everything that came before him, everything that existed while he was on this earth and everything since then. Jesus is superior. And we've seen that in his person that we focused on in the first section, then in his priesthood, and now we're in the third section of his perfecting power. And the purpose of the book has been to prove the superiority of Messiah's person and priesthood in order to exhort Jewish Christians to stand firm in Messiah. This would apply to us as well. And now we're in the final section, which is all about application. And this is really, we're going to move from doctrine to now that you know this doctrine, what is your response? And so uh, we're going to Go through a quick review of each section, though. We looked at Majesty of Messiah's person in chapters 1 through 6, and we saw that Jesus is superior to five 
are four different entities in this first section. Do you all remember what they are? Angels. Yep, angels. Moses. Yep. Aaron. Yes, there we go. Pamela. Prophets, angels, Moses, and Aaron. So those were the four. Uh, when comparing his person, he was compared to those four people or groups of people um, or the angels. And so uh, we that's a great section. If you're ever looking for the doctrine of Jesus, uh, go back to that first section. There is so much there that you don't find in other books. And so it's a, a great one to remember that Pema and who Jesus is superior to. And, uh, and then we saw it in sprinkled in that first section, there were three warnings. And we had the first warning in Hebrews 2, 1 through 4, and that was a warning against drifting from the word of God. And we were exhorted to pay more careful attention to it so that we don't drift away. We were warned against disbelieving what has been revealed and falling away from the living God. And then that warning of degeneration or dullness of hearing where you might believe God, but you won't be able to hear him because of that atrophy. And so those were warnings in the first section. Then we moved to the second section, which is the majesty of Messiah's priesthood in chapters 7 to 10. And in this section, we looked at four superior elements of the Messiah's priesthood. First, the superiority of his order. He wasn't a Levitical priest. He was in the order instead of Aaron. He was in the order of Melchizedek. So hopefully you're remembering who Melchizedek was. Then we saw in chapter 8 that he has a superior tabernacle and also a superior covenant. And then in uh, chapter 9, we saw that Jesus offered himself as a superior sacrifice to the sacrifices that preceded him that were intended to point towards him as we saw last week or before Thanksgiving in Hebrews 10. And that's where we saw the superior efficacy of Christ's sacrifice. That efficacy being the ability to produce a desired or intended result. And so Jesus is superior in his efficacy. And that's really, uh, we, we also then uh, received another warning in chapter 10, and that was despising the things that God has revealed. We saw that in Hebrews 10, 26 to 39, that we are not to despise what God has revealed. In fact, to despise what God has revealed is to despise his son and how much greater will be the judgment against those who despise and trample underfoot the son of God. And that was uh, a warning that uh, led into the chapter that we are going to be in uh, this evening. And also that was the end of that previous section. And now we're moving into the final section, which is, hey Don, which is a, uh, a section that deals with the application of what we have studied and specifically looking at Christ's perfecting power. There is still doctrine in this section, and it's always remember that are the changes that we make as we study God's word don't begin with us. It is always the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's in demonstration of the perfecting power of Christ. If you are truly in Christ, then you are transformed and you will be continually transformed, sanctified, as the Holy Spirit works to conform you to the very image of Christ. And so it's a, it's a demonstration of Christ's perfecting power as we are able to apply God's word. And so uh, there's a... There's an element of our participation, but apart from the Lord's equipping and the Holy Spirit's leading, then it would be empty, and it's not empty. And so keep that in mind as we study. There's doctrine, and then there's, uh, uh, but, there, but there are exhortations in this section. And so 
that's where we're going to be this evening is in chapter 11, which is a very unique chapter in all of scripture, where we see a very unique description of faith. This is the only time that faith is described. We hear faith all the way, you know, Old Testament, New Testament, it's about believing God. And we see faith as, as central to the New Testament. And yet we don't see faith described anywhere except in Hebrews 11. And so we're going to spend some time just on these first three verses because they are so unique, looking at what is faith. And then we'll move into the second section, which is to me, just fascinating. We could spend a lot of time there, and we're not going to. Um, but it's a demonstration of faith in the lives of 18 Old Testament uh, saints. And so we'll spend some time looking at their faith and hopefully drawing from it to inspire our own and see what is pleasing to God. How did these 18 people make it into the Faith Hall of Fame that we see in Hebrews 11? And so these are the two sections. Um, and through this passage, we're going to, our takeaway is to believe that God exists and earnestly seek him. And that that is something, that belief does come from God, but there is a response involved where we, uh, where we hear and then we make intentional decisions to believe. And that's our part. It's done by the Holy Spirit, but we yield to the Holy Spirit when we believe that God exists. And then we also earnestly seek him. We'll see where that comes from in our passage this evening. But let's begin with first the description of faith in verses one to three. And we begin with verse one that says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So here we have, for the, this is the only time that I see in scripture where it says this is what faith is. And it, there are two elements um, to faith in this description of faith. And those two elements are what? He says it is what? What follows that? Uh, what follows is assurance of, assurance of things hoped for. And then secondly, conviction of, things not seen. conviction of things not seen. I really camped on that as I was studying this passage. And I realized that faith, when we place our faith in Christ and in the things of God, what he has revealed, then it there's there's two different aspects to that. There's assurance of things hoped for. And if you look at that word assurance, the Greek word is hypostasis, which is, um, it carries the sense of a guarantee of ownership or entitlement. It's like a title, a deed. Contrasting in the Bible's context, the transitory character um, of the visible world with the reality of God. So there's a contrast in there. That's kind of the sense of this word, hypostasis. And when you are hypostasis, when you are assured of something, then you believe that it is guaranteed. You imagine that uh, when you're assured of something, that it is as good as done. So that's maybe a stronger word than when we think of our English assurance. Assurance is, is a hope, a strong hope. Whereas here, it's more, it's a little bit stronger than that. It's it's imagining it's as good as done. That's that's what it, there's almost there's a sense of a guarantee. And your, your assurance, your hypostasis gives you a sense of entitlement because it's something that you have received, even though it hasn't been fully realized, there's an expectation. You feel you're entitled to it in a sense. Um, and But again, it's that contrast between the reality of God that is unseen and then what is temporal in this world, uh, which we can see, it's visible. And, but your assurance is in the reality of God, that guarantee that you know God exists. 
and that is a guarantee. And if you know God and you know he exists, then you believe what he has revealed. And so um, and then that, so that's assurance of things hoped for. Now, the second element is somewhat like that, um, but it has a, a different uh, sense to it, conviction of things not seen. And so that word conviction that is glossed here in our English translations in Greek is elekkos, which is, carries the sense of the act of presenting evidence for the truth of something, proof, proving unseen things. And again, it's that contrast to the confidence we have in what we can see to that conviction of what we know to be true because it is of God. It's just believing in that unseen reality of God and the spiritual realities um, that are associated with that. And so that's more the conviction. It's, it's oh, well, and that's a good, our English, I think that's a good word, uh, conviction. It's, you have a, a commitment to a truth and a willingness to stand firm in that truth and even go as far as proving it. And um, it's holding that conviction. And so think about th this is what faith is. So we can kind of come up with our own way of describing faith. But here we have in Scripture this, this two aspect to biblical faith, which deals with assurance and conviction. So assurance is that believing um, it's as good as done. You have complete knowledge and belief, uh, assurance in what you cannot see, and then conviction, uh, the willingness to stand firm. And there's almost like assurance has a sense, as I studied this, of a, it's your hopes being realized. And so uh, assurance is looking forward to what you are hoping for and believing that it will be realized even if it hasn't been. And then conviction is in more has a present sense in the present time where you have a, a conviction of what you cannot see but you know is true. And so it compels you in this present age, whereas assurance is looking to the future, um, to that forward hope. So there's also a sense with faith of future and future hope and present conviction. And so be thinking about this definition um, and think about what it means to have that kind of strong assurance and also conviction that make up biblical faith. And uh, as we especially go through this chapter, because this is the type of faith that pleases God. This is, this is the type of faith that these Old Testament saints had that were pleasing to him. And, and it is important because the object of our faith will determine your eternal destiny. Faith in Christ results in eternal life. And if your faith is fully invested in anything else apart from Christ, then that, if it, if it leaves no room for faith in God and faith in Christ, then that leads to condemnation. And um, those who lack biblical faith will perish. So it's important to understand the object of our faith, too, that we have biblical assurance conviction in Christ himself. So uh, these first three verses are worth uh, kind of plunging and thinking about. Anybody have any feedback on how this, uh, what you think about biblical faith? What stands out to you? In these, in this first verse, and if you haven't thought about it, I spent quite a bit of time just meditating on this definition, and the more time I spent thinking about the aspect of assurance versus conviction the difference between the temporal, what I can see, and what I can't see, and the fact that it's necessary to walk by faith um, rather than by sight. Sometimes we become so dependent on God giving us visible affirmation 
when true faith is believing what he has revealed without having to see that type of uh, affirmation. And so it's not necessary to see signs from God. Yes, Don. How do we um, interpret this or read this in conjunction with in, Rom in Romans where it talks about faith being a gift? Yes. How do we tie these, our position, but yet it's a gift. If it's a gift, then it's not something that we do. So. Yeah. Maybe some fuzzy areas there. Exactly. Me. And that's why I, I focus on application saying, remember, it all starts with God. And so application, us, the ability to exercise faith is a gift that comes from God. And so in our study of Romans, we, we did say that faith is a gift from God, that no one can believe unless God has first uh, awakened them because of uh, they were spiritually dead and dead people can't do anything on their own. And so God has to give life before a person can respond in faith. And so our response of faith is, is very dependent on the work of God in our lives prior to that. But there is a sense of our participation as well, and that God does call us to yield and respond to the Holy Spirit's conviction um, and the revelation of God's word. And so uh, it's, there is a tension there, Don. And there's nothing we're going to be able to say tonight that's going to totally um, remove that tension. But this does. Um, this is a good description. This yeah. is a good description of what are, are about that gift. Yes, it is. It's more about a description of faith than a call to, to exercise it. And so it is describing the gift. That's a great way to put it, Don. It's a it is a way that God is describing the faith he gives us. Um, so if you have faith that's come from God, it should be accompanied with that type of assurance that is steadfast as well as um, conviction. Yeah. We should it's not a bad tension. When you say sense of tension, sometimes to my mind makes things it's bad. Okay. But it's not a bad tension, is it? And when you say there's tension there, that's not yeah. a bad thing. Not tension is in the sense of hostility, but tension in the sense that we're stretched, that there's there's just something a little bit where, you know, there's always that discussion between the sovereignty of God right. versus the will of man. Right. And there's a tension between, okay, if God is sovereign, then what is our part? And anytime we're talking about faith, that comes up because faith is a gift from God. And yet we're called, as we'll see in this chapter, to exercise it. Um, and so I think God gives us the gift of faith. And then it's, it's our gift that is intended to be exercised in response. Um, but what we should experience as we're exercising the gift of faith that comes from God is this complete assurance. If you have that assurance... You just know, it, you know, there's just something where no one has to try to convince you that God exists. There reaches a point where you just know that. And perhaps we can't explain it even in human terms, but in your heart, you know. And that's a gift from God. That's that assurance that comes from him that is described here as hypostasis. And then we have the conviction. There it is where you know, you're compelled. You're compelled. That's why we're all here. We're, we're compelled to want to know more about the God that we know and are known by, and yet he's invisible. And so we're compelled. You know, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm spending hours studying the word, I'm compelled. And it's that desire to want to know God. And guess what? That's a desire that he gives. Um, and then you have times in your life that you might not feel that strongly compelled, but it is a work of the Spirit, and it's something to be yielded to and exercised. And so you're right, Don. It's a description of, of the gift that he's given. This is how we should be experiencing it. Yeah. Jessica? Yeah. This, is a pro, this verse is a... Every time I would shoot an instrument approach where you can't see the runway, yeah, it's all fog. I, but I'd say, faith is being sure of what I hope for and certain of what I do not see. <laughs> I'm going by the evidence of the of the instruments. 
I'm sure there's a runway out there. I'm sure there's I'm not going to yeah. off the trees or in traffic or in cars or something. I'm sure of this. I can't see it yet, but I'm positive. The evidence is there. And then poof, you come out and there's there's a runway light in front of you. Yeah. Brant so, is a pilot, so that's the reason why he's if you're not if you don't know what his analogy is, he's talking about approaching a runway in an airplane. When it's foggy. In the fog. Where you can't yeah. see the you can't see it. Yeah. You can't see it without, I mean, you're in the clouds, you, you've got no idea. Okay, now that's not making me feel really <laughs> confident when I'm flying on an airplane. You know, I, I don't want my pilot to have to say, okay, this is just right. But in the same sense, it's not just the hope the runway's there. <laughs> you know, that's a good description, Brad. Oh, no, that's it. The faith of being sure yeah. of what I hope for and certain. Uh, what I do not see. So the pilot has enough information that he's not I'm approaching. I'm certain of what I do not see. Right. I'm certain there's a runaway in front of me. That does make sense. So you're not like, you're not, and that's why I don't really like the word assurance. It's too soft for what's being described here. Because when you're approaching a runway, whether you see it or not, you're certain because you have enough I'm, information, you're certain the runway's there. I'm positive there's a runway there. Yeah. And I'm just waiting until I can see it. Yeah. And so that is what we're talking about. It's that kind of assurance. It's more than a hope. It's an absolute, I know it's there. That's why I keep going. And This is where I am. Yeah. Now, positive. there might be people, now Brant and I love to, uh, to speak in terms of, uh, of pictures, and so I hope that helps you, but... I know if I'm on the airplane and I don't know a lot about airplanes, then I might not know that runway is there, but I do want my pilot to know. And so we are at different stages of spiritual growth. But if we are growing and knowing God's word, then we should grow in our assurance. If you don't have complete assurance yet, you know, our study of God's word is what leads to that absolute knowing. Um, so that's a great description, Brent, of that. That's what life is right now. I'm sure there's a God. I'm sure there's a life after this. Yeah. I can't see it yet. Yeah. I'm certain of where I will land. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't spend my days wondering when or if Jesus is going to appear. I wonder when he's going to appear. I wonder if it will be today. I wonder if it will be this week or this month, this year. I don't wonder if he's going to appear. It's I'm far beyond that. Now it's just when. And as we study the book of Revelation, we're going to become more intensely aware of the imminency of his appearing. But we can be sure. And so uh, in verse 2 says that it is by this type of faith, for by it the men of old gained approval. So it is through this faith that men of old, talking about these Old Testament saints, gained approval with God. So when we ask that question that comes up so often, you know, how did people before Jesus gain God's approval? Here we have it right here, the same way we do, that um, they gained that approval by faith, by believing what God has revealed and taking that to heart. And what is that faith that they had, the Old Testament saints, it was assurance of things hoped for and conviction of things not seen. That's what they believed, and that it was that faith, that assurance, that conviction that gained God's approval. And we'll see that in the lives of these Old Testament saints. Then verse 3 says, By faith we understand that worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. We understand that God did not create the worlds by repurposing things that already existed. Instead, and he didn't conquer the worlds and establish himself as king of all nations. 
Instead, we understand by faith that God created all things, and he created all things from nothing. Um, that, is our, that is what we are to have assurance of and conviction of. God is the creator king, and the worlds were, pre, were created. It says here, prepared. Um, by the word of God, which in this context can be understood to refer to who is the word of God? Jesus. He is the living word of God. In fact, it tells us in Colossians uh, 1, 15 to 18 that uh, of Christ, it says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. So when it says in verse 15, he's the firstborn of all creation, this doesn't mean that he was born physically, like firstborn, uh, like he was created, that God didn't create him, and that's false religions have all been started because of that interpretation. Instead, it's the firstborn he is, he has the rights of the firstborn son. Um, and so he's the, the firstborn of all creation. He has preeminence over all of creation. All things were created through him and all things were created for him. And so he has preeminence. Um, and that is why the book of Hebrews has rightly argued the supremacy of Christ in all things because all things were created through him and for him. Uh, you and I were created through Jesus and for Jesus. And so if you want to know your purpose in life, just ask Jesus, because you were created through him, you were created for him. And you notice in this ver verse, it says all things. So that includes men, women, all of creation was created through Jesus and for him. And then uh, it says this, this first phrase, pay attention to this by faith. This was probably the biggest discovery that I have had in this uh, studying this passage this time is that phrase that is glossed by faith. I kept going back to it because it's repeated. And so then I went into the Greek and I realized that the Greek word piste it occurs 18 times in 18 verses in all of Scripture. It only appears in the book of Hebrews. And so that phrase, by faith, now we might read other Scriptures outside. We do read this. You'll read by faith 41 different times in the English. But the actual Greek expression that we see here in Hebrews, by faith, which is the dative form of, of this noun, um, that's it only appears in the book of Hebrews, and it appears 18 times. Um, and all times, it's, it's by faith. So this truly is a unique chapter that is dealing on what it means for, you know, to believe by faith. And for the 18, it just happens to be that does occur 18 times, and then there's 18 men and women who are described by, uh, they're, they're commended um, by faith for what they had done. So it's an interesting phrase there. And, and I had never actually heard that or read that. So uh, that was interesting to me this time. So let's kind of for, just kind of summarize these first three verses. And uh, we see faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So that is what faith is. When people ask you, well, what, what do I have to do you know, to have faith in Jesus that leads to salvation? Well, it's that assurance of things hoped for, conviction of things not seen. And so that's, uh, uh, 
Um, that is our definition of faith. If you want to know where to go in the Bible to find the definition of faith, this is the only place, the description of faith that you can go is in Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. Is she okay? Okay. All right. And so here is a timeless truth um, that we can just gain from these verses. God's approval is gained by faith, piste. And faith being the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So how, how, do, you, how do you gain God's approval? It is piste, by faith, by this assurance of things hoped for and conviction of things not seen. So that assurance is looking to the future and believing what you're hoping for is as good as done. And so your hope isn't like, oh, I'm hoping. It's a hope that is, it's, you know it. It's like Brant saying with the runways in front of you, you just know it. And then conviction is in this present day, you have a conviction that your world, your reality is not just in what you can see. There is a spiritual realm that is a reality whether we see it or not. And so it's the conviction is more about uh, this present age. So we're wanting to have that assurance and conviction that gains God's approval. And so think about that. How are you seeking to please God? Are you seeking other ways to please God, not realizing that it is through this type of faith that we gain God's approval? And then how certain are you that someday your hope will be fully realized? Are you still wrestling with doubt? Um, that's where I think we have to be willing to lay our doubts down and be intentional about not questioning the things that God has revealed. God is not obligated to prove himself to you. He doesn't have to appear for you to believe. He is, his approval is gained by those who receive what he has revealed in his word by faith. And then how certain, um, how convicted are you of spiritual realities that can't be seen? I still encounter people who really struggle with the fact that what we, that we're not, that we don't have a God who is cut off from his creation. We have a God who communes with his people. And he wants to spend time with us. He wants to, us to pray to him in faith. And so that is part of that conviction. It's, it's that compelling desire to know God because he knows you and to want to spend time with him. Any other thoughts about these first three verses? Pretty solid in your faith. All right. Well, let's go on to the second section where we look at the demonstration of this type of faith. It was the time that I invested in the three verses that enriched my study of these 18 Old Testament saints because I had a frame of reference now for what type of faith that they were exercising that gained their place in this Hall of Fame of those who have noteworthy faith. And so uh, be thinking about the quality of their faith. When each time we read Piste by faith, we're thinking of the assurance that they lived with as well as the conviction. And so, again, we are exhorted to believe that God exists and earnestly seek him in the same way that we'll see these Old Testament saints. We begin with verses 4 and 5, where it says, By faith... Um, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And that's an interesting verse. Um, and, you know, when we just see how briefly that, especially Enoch, is mentioned in the Old Testament, which on each one of these slides, and if you did your lessons, then you would have spent quite a bit of time in these verses going back to look at the Old Testament context 
for each one of these saints. Um, and so I'm not going to go, I don't think Hebrews 11 intended us to study the history, the historical context of each one of these 18. Instead, it's looking at the quality of their faith. So I'm going to assume you did your lessons and that you know the, the context of these saints. So be thinking about the quality. Why was Abel commended? And we know that Abel, I mean, he goes all the way back to the beginning of time. He is the son of who? Adam and Eve. Yeah. And so you have Cain and Abel, and Cain ended up killing Abel out of jealousy. But here we have Abel, it's saying that he still speaks, even though he's dead and he was murdered, and God uh, cursed Cain because of that. But yet, because of the quality of his faith before he died, um, he is still speaking because we're reading about him in Hebrews 11. And here we are in the 21st century, still talking about Abel. Think about that. I mean, we don't know a whole lot about him, but the quality of his faith has caused us to still be talking about him in the 21st century. And his faith, the only thing that is explained about Abel is that he made an offering to God. He was a herdsman, so he made his offering from his flocks. Uh, versus Cain, who made an offering. He was a farmer, so he made an offering from the land. And Cain, his offering was not acceptable to God, whereas Abel's was. God despised Cain's offering and yet commended Abel. So a lot of theologians have said, well, does that mean making offerings of animals by blood is better than grain offerings and so forth. And I really don't think that we're given that indication in these verses. I think it's more the fact that Abel's heart, and especially when we see the context here in Hebrews 11, it was his faith um, that made him acceptable and his offering acceptable to God. Uh, whereas Cain became bitter against his brother and ended up killing him. And so his heart was not right with God, as opposed to his brother. And then we have Enoch, who is even more mysterious. He's mentioned in uh, just Gen Genesis 5, 21, four verses. And it just basically says that he walked with God, and then he was no more because God took him up. And it doesn't say he died. He just, whoop. So there we have maybe a hint of the rapture. Some people have suggested that you can go back and look at Enoch's life and see evidence or a foreshadowing of the rapture. It doesn't tell us a lot about what pleased God about him other than he walked. The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament versus the, the Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew, uh, took a, a different interpretation of uh, saying instead of he walked with God, uh, it says in the Septuagint, he pleased God. And so perhaps there's, uh, maybe, maybe that's carrying the sense of what it means to walk with God, uh, that he pleased God, and therefore he was taken up. And so what, what do you learn? What speaks to you about the faith of Abel and Enoch? Any thoughts? Pleases God. They, that's a good way to be. Yeah. It pleases God, and that God is very concerned with the heart condition of our faith, that there needs to be pure motives, that faith in God needs to result in a, a pure devotion to him that is reflected vertically with our relationship with others. We gain that through Abel, but through Enoch, it was just that God is a God who wants to commune with his people, that it is faith in the unseen to the sense that, I don't know about you, but God is... I may not be able to see God, but I am very aware that I am walking closely with a living God, aren't you? And so there's no excuse to say that, you know, I don't believe in what I cannot see because he is a reality that we commune with the same way that Enoch communed with God. We have that potential to walk with God. And so it's kind of what leads up to verse six, where it says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Uh, for he who comes to God, two things, must believe that he, ex that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So what, 
what pleases God? What does this verse say is pleasing to God? There's, again, two aspects to it. He is. Yeah. And you're, you know, he rewards it. See? Yeah. And so, you know, and I know, I, I know that I'm expecting great rewards from God, okay? Just the riches that are available to us all in Christ are infinite. And so uh, to believe that God is rewarding us with so great a salvation as we have in Christ there's nothing wrong with being motivated by those rewards. And guess what? There will be a reward ceremony. So if, if God has given you much, which each one of you, I'm looking up and I've, I know that, you know, each one of you have been here through this study and God has equipped you. Well, he's now entrusted a lot to you, a lot of revelation that we might take for granted in this area that we live in. But comparatively, you, you're rich in your wisdom and knowledge of God. And so there's almost a sense of, um, uh, you know, wanting to be there, that conviction, that compelling desire to serve him um, should also be a part of it. And the result of that will be a reward. And it's okay to look forward um, to those rewards that will come. And even just simply through by faith, the rewards that come, as we will see with these Old Testament saints. And then we see in verse 7, we now move to Noah, who we, his, you can look at Genesis 6, 13 to 22, and find uh, the heart of his story. But again, piste, by faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness of which is according to faith. So what is remarkable about Noah's faith? It was an obedient faith. It was an obedient faith. So there was action in response to what God revealed, that he actually, he was warned, and he didn't just sit at home worried about it, he did what God told him to do, build an ark. You know, I've heard it suggested that it had never rained up to this point. I think he got a lot of ridicule. He got a lot of ridicule. It wasn't just an easy road. No, it wasn't. He was preaching um, that, hey, repent or you will perish. And he <laughs> built the ark, and it was, it was intended uh, for anyone who, who, had, you know, who heard and responded in faith, and yet no one except his household entered into that ark, and so all perished. And so in that sense, he condemned the world through his preaching. And also stood out to me and he said that he feared. He was in reverence. Yes. So Laura said also what stood out to her was that he had a reverence, that there was a reverent fear of God. And, oh, isn't that lacking in this generation where we're no longer seeing God reverenced. In fact, I'm not even hearing a whole lot of talk about God the Father, um, and yet he is to be reverenced. And so these were all things that were pleasing to God. These are the faith of no was pleasing to God, that kind of reverent and obedient response. And then we go to verses 8 to 10. Now we're post-flood. Everything up to this point has been prior to the flood, and now we're post-flood. The uh, story of Abraham, he actually lived around 2150 B.C., and it says, Pis day by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob fellow heirs of the same promise, for he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So what was Abraham's faith? It was very forward. You know, he was looking, it was that anticipation. Uh, he had hope that goes back to the airplane. He knew it was going to happen. It was just a matter of when. And when it described him, uh, he, he, how is he described? He lived as an alien in the land of promise, in a foreign land. Um, 
and we'll see that discussed a little bit more a little bit later. But what type of city was he looking forward to? He was looking forward to a heavenly city. And so Abraham, if you've ever been to the wilderness and where he, he dwelled was in Hebron for the most part, and it's in a desert. It's called the Judean wilderness. I mean, it looks like a desert. And yet that's where he lived in tents. He didn't build houses. He wasn't looking for God's promises, and God had promised him greatly. But he didn't look to see those realized in this present life. You didn't see him building palaces and, you know, as if he anticipated this was his home. Instead, he lived in tents and waited. So I would say that Abraham was the first minimalist <laughs> that lived. Uh -huh. he, he was like, just, just going to wait. He was wait. He knew that what he was looking forward to would be uh, what would come in the future. And then we have Sarah in verses 11 and 12. And Piste, by faith, even Sarah herself received ability con to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore, which was part of the covenant promise uh, to Abraham. And so Sarah herself, how old was Sarah when she conceived? Does anybody know? Yeah, I think she was 90 or 91. Yeah, when when she had uh, Isaac and she had been barren before that point. And so when God first gave Abraham the promise that he would become a great nation, which is what we find in Genesis 12. This is after Abraham, by faith, had left his home, what he was familiar with at the age of 75, um, and had left his home to travel to Canaan, a place he'd never been before, all because God called, told him to. So he picked up and left, went to the promised land, and that's where he received at age 75 the promise that God would cause him to become a great nation. The only problem was, how could you become a great nation if you had no offspring? But, but Abraham believed, and that was at age 75. It was going to be a 25-year wait until the actual birth of Isaac. I would be thinking, okay, God, you're running out of time because my biological clock is ticking, and it's already seems too late. If Abraham was 75 when he received the promise that he would become a great nation and, and Sarah was about 10 years younger, then she was about 65, 66 and, and so it's hard to, you know, it would have been hard to believe that. But uh, then they, even after that, they had a 25-year wait until Isaac was finally born. And so we can understand why they tried to, manu you know, manipulate things through his, Sarah's maidservant, Hagar. But, um, but still, uh, she was able to conceive, and it says here in Hebrews 11, why? What is the first word? By faith, piste. So there was an element of faith involved as uh, Sarah believed those promises just as Abraham did. And I love that Sarah is mentioned too, because usually we just focus on Abraham. Uh, verses 13 to 16, it says, All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And so uh, it is, uh, we see here that again, they lived as strangers and exiles during their time on earth. And God is not ashamed to be called their God because they lived that way. They didn't consider this earth their home. And that is why it says God is not ashamed to be called their God. And guess what? He has prepared a city for them. 
anything stand out to you? And this is Hebrews 11 talking about the Old Testament saints. So you sometimes get people asking, well, how are they even saved? Um, and we can see here very clearly that it was by faith, that faith being assurance and conviction. Anything else stand out to you from, and then we, it does go on to talk more about, uh, about Abraham as in relation to also Isaac, his son, and then Jacob, and then Jacob's son, Joseph. And we see this in verses 17 to 22, and it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. By faith, Isaac was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each one of his sons of Joseph, one of, each one of the sons of Joseph, and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. So what stands out to you in these verses? Um, Abraham, if you go back to Genesis 22, you'll read about how he took his one and only son that he had waited 25 years to get, and God tells him to sacrifice his one and only son. And so Abraham willingly laid down Isaac on the altar and prepared to take his life, to kill him, offering up, him up as a living sacrifice. How does that demonstrate Abraham's faith? Well, it says right there, he considered that God is able to raise people from the dead. Yeah. And so that type, Isaac was a type of foreshadowing the resurrection, even of God's own son. Um, it says, you know, Abraham at that time must have been thinking, you've got to be kidding me. Okay, so I'm going to lay down my only son, through whom is my only hope for God to fulfill his promises. And knowing God, you knew God was bound to fulfill his promises. So Abraham had to be wondering, either he's going to bring him back to life. That must have been, well, it says here that he... He must have just concluded God could bring him back to life. And he did receive him back. He didn't actually go through with the killing. God provided a sacrifice, which again foreshadowed the sacrifice of Christ. And that was all intended to provide a type that pointed people of faith forward to the resurrection of Christ, even from that time. So even today, the people who would say, well, Christianity is just a new religion and Christ was just a good man who died. We can go back to Genesis 22 and see that even then God was pointing us forward. And it was through the faith of Abraham that that incident took place. And then we see this interesting thing about Isaac. Is that, um, uh oh, oh, did I? Is that a type? It must be. You know what? I was just reading that. That is a typo. And I was like, that sounds like Enoch. <laughs> did you hear me pause? I'm like, how did I miss that while I was going through it the first time? I was telling myself I'm going to have to go back and read that again. Yes, that is a typo. <laughs> yeah, I didn't either. So I was reading that going, <laughs> Isaac was taken up. How did I miss that? So instead it should be in verse 20. Yeah, I, I, uh, I didn't want to have to keep changing the type size, so I was I was typing over. Okay, so verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. And so there we go. He, he blessed his two sons, Jacob and Esau, concerning future events because of his, his assurance and conviction of those things. And then Jacob did the same thing. And you can go back and it's a fascinating study to go back and study the way that Jacob blessed the 12 tribes of Israel and how those blessings played out in the lives of those tribes. And then Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel from Egypt and then gave 
orders concerning his bones because Joseph died in Egypt. But where did he want to be buried? In Israel, in the promised land. So that demonstrated his faith as well. And those uh, references up at the top uh, will help you to go back. And they're also in your lesson. Then we see in verses 23 to 26, where it says, By faith, piste, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. What stands out to you? This is talking about Moses. Moses was born in 1525 BC before Christ. And what was Moses? What did it say that he chose to endure rather than being being raised in royalty? Mistreatment rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. Right. And then and then also it says he considered what did he consider to be of greater riches than the treasures of Egypt? The reproach of Christ. So he was looking forward to the reward. And we, you know, that reproach of Christ, did he have conscious knowledge of Jesus during his life? And did he make a decision that would support that idea that the Old Testament saints had that opportunity to look forward to the promise of Christ? Um, and somehow that was revealed to them in their age, most likely through the messianic promises that have come through the ages. And so, uh, so that is the type of faith that was pleasing to God. And then we see, we see Israel, who is spoken of as a nation and their faith while they were in Egypt and also during the Exodus in verses 27 to 29. I think it's interesting. We deal with 18 different individuals. You see that by faith isn't always associated with individuals. It's sometimes mentioned more than once, like with Moses, but there's 18 by faith. And we're talking about 18 individuals. Verses 27 to 29, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. Verse 28, by faith he kept the Passover and the, oh my goodness, am I, is this, this should be, let's see, all right, okay, yep, oh, this is still talking about Moses. Okay, and then in verse 29, it talks about the Israel. I'm sorry about that. So, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch him. And then by faith, speaking of all of Israel, they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land. And the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. So we, again, we see that forward faith, forward-looking faith that we need to have as well, evidenced in Moses. Anything stand out to you in, that, in those verses? You know, it took acts of faith for them to sprinkle the blood on the door frames of their homes so that the Passover, um, so that the destroyer would pass over um, their homes, and uh, so it did take faith on their part. Here is where we see now moving forward in verses 30 to 31, uh, the faith of Israel during the conquest. We've been studying the book of Joshua, so this is speaking of that time period, around 1406 B.C., covering about a 25-year period, or the conquest took about seven years, and we have Rahab, who is in Joshua 2, it says in verses 30 to 31, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab the harlot, she's still being called the harlot. <laughs> There's almost, almost a badge of honor at this point. Just the truth of who she was. And even Rahab, she appears also in uh, Matthew uh, in Christ's genealogy. Uh, but by faith Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. So what, how you respond to the faith that God gives results in a reward and also approval. 
So that faith isn't just for the sake of salvation. How we act in response to the faith given, how you exercise your faith, does determine the measure of God's approval and also the reward. That's what we're seeing here. Because uh, all of Israel, not just Moses, was saved, but it was Moses' faith that was commended. And then also Rahab, she acted in faith. And then we see in verses uh, 32 to 38, where we're still, now it kind of just does, it's kind of like a finale. These are the honorable mentions, where it says, in, it says, And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed act of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quench the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection, and others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword, They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. So anyone who thinks that once you put your faith in God that nothing bad will happen to you, that has never been the case. In this world, Jesus says you will have trouble. Um, So I don't know if... All of them experienced all of these, but collectively, that's some pretty severe suffering. And yet they uh, performed act of righteousness um, and received God's approval. Here they are, Hebrews 11. Is there anybody that is not mentioned in this chapter that surprises you? I thought of someone. Just uh, as David, a, David, David's David, David's oh, here. I'm sorry. Yep, David's right <laughs> after Jephthah. Yeah. The short prophet. The short prophet Elijah. Nehemiah. Who? Oh, <laughs> Nehemiah. Yeah, you don't see Nehemiah there. Yeah. <laughs> Nehemiah. <laughs> Who else don't we see here that we might have anticipated? Oh, and we probably shouldn't do that because that's hardly fair. I was thinking Daniel. Is that not surprising? And Isaiah, is Isaiah here? Well, oh, you know what? The prophets. That's who. That, that would be collectively where it says the prophets would include both Isaiah and Daniel and all of the prophets. Because, uh, I mean, they, yeah. So, <laughs> what's that? That's a little song about the Oh, could you sing it for us? No? (laughs) Is it the same one? Did we learn that in BSF? Yep, that's exactly the one that I sing as well. No, well, we would. Yeah. So, but that's, yeah, we've got 12 minor prophets, and then we've got the five major prophets. And so all of them would be included here. All right. And then finally in verses 39 to 40, it gives us a summary statement of all of their faiths. It says, And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. And I just think about how they had to wait. They were given great promises, and yet they didn't even expect for those promises to be fulfilled in this life. And that kind of helps if you're going through times of suffering to understand that it's not about what we receive in this life. Um, It is about what is promised to us when we suffer well and endure in faith of what is to come. And that is the type of faith that gains God's approval. I mean, these are the best of the best. They're mentioned in Hebrews 11. And was their life without suffering? No. It, in fact, was marked by, you know, an excess of suffering. And, you know, there are some people who are so poorly informed that they see people suffering and they think that, oh, they must have done something wrong. 
instead of recognizing that it's through that suffering that even greater reward comes in the life to come. And so just as these Old Testament saints look forward in faith, we can, we can really be encouraged um, by that. So a summary statement for these verses, the people of old who gained approval by their faith include Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Israel, Rahab the harlot, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. I almost didn't put Rahab the harlot. I thought she should get to lose that title in the New Testament. And yet, I think that there it's, it's profound that you have Rahab the harlot in this list as well as in the list of Christ's genealogy. And there is hope for all of us. Well, I think a lot of these individuals were flawed at one, you know, at one point. Sure. Exactly. Just, you know, part of their background. But they still have faith. And so you can be a flawed person and still have faith. Yes, what and Laura not, is saying. Not following, you know, not always going back to it. But you can be a flawed individual. Absolutely. Laura is saying you can be a flawed individual and still have commendable faith. And, and I think it's even more commendable that you have a harlot up here. It's not about how righteous we manage to make ourselves. It's what is, what, why are they, it is to stay by faith. It is that faith that God gains God's approval. And so God was not ashamed of her being a harlot. He, she is titled that from the, when we first get introduced to her in Joshua 2, here we say our goodbyes to Rahab in, in uh, Hebrews 11, which is work towards the end of the New Testament. We, we, we are probably assuming that she repented. We are assuming that she had repented at this point, yes. Um, or, at least, or at least there was a transformation where she didn't have to resort um, to that lifestyle. And yet there's no shame in what she was because she was commended for her faith. And that faith was demonstrated in receiving the spies by faith. And in this study, I did go back to the Old Testament. I just decided we're not going to spend so much time in the context. But if you go back into Joshua 2 and you hear what she says um, to the spies about God, and you, and you have to think about the fact that she was uh, in a pagan nation. They didn't have the revelation of God. She didn't have the training. She didn't have um, she didn't have scripture. But she says in in Joshua two eleven when she's speaking to the spies, she said, "When we heard it, talking about how they had come out of Egypt on dry land, crossing the Red River, and how what they did to the two kings of the Amorites beyond the Jordan, she." she recognized this is the hand of God. She says in verse 11, when we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you also will deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth. It was her faith in recognizing the one true God, that the God of Israel is the one true God that gained God's approval. She and her household were saved and she became an ancestor to Messiah himself. And so that is truly remarkable and does tell us that it is by faith, piste, that God is pleased, that we gain his approval. And so that's our takeaway. God is pleased by faith that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. If you want to gain God's approval, believe that. Believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder. Look forward with anticipation to the coming of Christ, uh, knowing that he is the one who will bring that great reward with him. So how are you seeking to please God? And out of this list, whose faith it most inspires you and why? Any Anybody most, are you impacted by anyone's faith in a way that as you think about it, maybe you'll think about as we go from here, but what changes could you make in your thoughts about God or in your actions towards God as a result of studying this passage? 
Um, God is not trying to teach us doctrine as much as he is trying to inspire us to make adjustments both in our thinking and in our relationship and our actions towards him and towards others. Anyone stand out to you in this list? I think Abraham, Abraham just because when knowing that he may have to kill his child, it's like it's as good as done because he's going to raise it from the dead. Yeah. Have that kind of faith. Right. As a mother, we can't even imagine being asked to do such a thing. And yet Abraham's faith was in God, that God could raise him up from the dead. Just having that kind of faith is remarkable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I like what Sarah, um, she, I can't find it right here, but she believed in, she had, she had faith because she had, he was, she thought he was faithful. The one who made the promise was faithful. So I didn't really say that. Her faith was based on God's faith. Yes. The promises that he made, because he was a faithful God. Right. So her faith was based on the faithfulness of God. Laura is saying that her faith was based on the character of God, that God was faithful, therefore she believed. And her, her name means laughter, and she laughed when she received the promise, but she believed because here in Hebrews 11, it was by faith that she conceived. And so it was that faith response that allowed her to conceive. You know, I have prayed for people before who will, who will say, well, no answers, no answers, still no answers, nothing's changed. And sometimes I wonder, you know, there's faith. When, when we're praying and when we're praying for each other, there, there needs to be a faith response both in those who are praying and also those who are receiving um, those prayers. I think that that faith is powerful and brings about great change. Let's go ahead and close up with a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, giving us these examples of faith that inspire our own. And I pray, Father, that by the Spirit, you will continue to change our thinking in response to the doctrine that we have studied in the book of Hebrews, and it will result in life transformation. I pray, Father, that our strength will be, our, that our faith will be strengthened. And as a result of that, that we will have the kind of faith that inspires faith in others. And Father, that goes, uh, that as we go forward as ambassadors of Christ, I pray that our faith will shine brightly as a testimony of the love and the truth in the life that is found only in your son. And that is a work that only you can do. And we ask your blessing and favor, Father, for, uh, for our faith to be strengthened as a testimony to your glory and the glory of your son. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.